Welcome to the Farley Church of Christ, and for those of you who are watching on uh, Facebook or YouTube, we're glad that you took the time this morning to uh, worship God despite everything that's going on. I have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we're doing a trial of the new members directory. The info is on the Farley Facebook page. If you're not on Facebook, then you can contact uh, either me or my wife Janelle for info on how to log into that uh, directory. Uh, Perlene Montgomery is still not doing well, um, but she is still um, able to have visitors and able to see people, and the family um, would appreciate if you went up and, and saw her, and I know the families would appreciate your prayers as well. Uh, also, the nation right now, as we're deciding what to do and businesses are beginning to open up, just that uh, things can transition smoothly and that we can get back on track and that uh, churches and uh, businesses can go on doing things without uh, causing, I guess, uh, more sickness. It's also Mother's Day, so I want to thank all of the mothers out there, who, uh, especially mothers in the church that are raising up their children uh, in the Lord and um, for all the work that they do. I know watching my mom growing up with uh, three boys, uh, I don't know how she did it, and I know that there are a lot of moms who are just working 24-7 to uh, just get their kids uh, alive uh, or to grow up healthy. Uh, Proverbs 23, 22, and 23 says, Listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it by wisdom, instruction, and understanding. We will have a song leading by Robert Nance, and then we will move through the service uh, in a little bit of a different way, but I hope that you will join us and worship our God together this morning. Our first song today will be 303, 303, Heavenly Sunlight. We'll sing the first and third verse. 303, let us sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep Bow with me, pray, please. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the many blessings. Thank you for us gathering here today. Thank you for the veterans and the soldiers in service. Thank you for everything. Amen. Our next song is number 58. Number five eight, a wonderful savior. We sing the first and last verse on this one. First and fourth verse. Let us sing. A wonderful savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful savior to me. He Oh, my. 
partake of the Lord's Supper, let us try to focus on exactly what we're to do here today. We're to remember Christ, the sacrifice he made on our behalf, and honor him for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. Scripture reading comes from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, starting with verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we are like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a sheep, as a lamb, to the slaughter. So even back when this book was written, Isaiah told us what was going to happen to our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let us always remember that through him and only him, we have that promise of a home in heaven by the sacrifice he made on our behalf. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day you've given us and for this opportunity we have to gather here to worship and honor you, to thank you for all the many blessings that we receive each and every day. We're most thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth to live among us to show us how we should love one another, compassion for one another, and help one another in need. We thank you that through his example, we can pattern our lives after. We thank you for him suffering and dying on that cross to pay for each one of our sins that we are not required to do. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for the love he has for us. May we always try to honor him. At this time, Lord, we ask your blessings on this bread, which represents the body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We also ask your blessings on this cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood, which was shed to cover our sins. May we partake of it with a grateful and thankful heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our next song will be number 616. 616. Love lifted me. And we'll sing the uh, first and third verse. Joan gets tired of singing this song a lot, but it was my favorite for, for my dad. It was dad's favorite, and I can remember him as a kid singing out so loud. He didn't have a pretty voice, but he did love to sing this song. So we'll sing the first and third verse. Let us sing. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply sank within. Seeking to rise no more, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. I will be reading Psalm chapter 16, verse 9. Psalm chapter 16, verse 9. <clears throat> Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoice. My body also will rest sisters. It is almost impossible to escape what is going on in the world right now. I don't mean just escape the uh, disease itself or the pandemic itself, but it's impossible to escape the effects of it. It's hard to go anywhere without seeing how much this virus has changed the world. It's changed the, the way that we gather together here. It's changed the way that businesses are operated. It's changed things in government and in the economy. I mean, it has is, is changed so much, and it's caused so much panic, and it seems to be the only thing that is on the mind and on the mouths of people today. We spend so much time wringing our hands and burning time and energy and working ourselves up to the point that our focus is no longer on hope and the assurance that we claim to have as Christians. Now, I know that that's not the case all across the board, but I have seen, and I'm sure you have as well, on social media and in conversations of people just so worked up and afraid about the things that are happening in the world today. Now, we do live in uncertain times, and, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know what will happen with our nation, 
but we do get caught up in things like this. And this is not the first event that's happened uh, in history where people have reacted this way. In fact, even in, in my own lifetime, there have been other uh, types of illnesses and things that have risen up that have gotten people worked up and, uh, and afraid. But this morning, I want to do something different. I want to just focus on the hope that we have. I just want to focus on the assurance that we have. And I want to refocus on those unshakable things, the things that don't change. Peace, wars, rise and fall of nations, life and death, every human uh, disease, plague, treaties, laws, kings to presidents, governments, the stock market. But one thing and only one thing is always constant, and that is God. When the world and the church are panicking about the same issues, then there's an even bigger issue. And that is the message that we are giving the world as the church. And that is our God isn't really that powerful. But whether that's the message that we're giving or not, it's not true. We're, we've got an opportunity right now as the church, we've got an opportunity to, to preach a sermon that won't be ignored. It's the sermon that we can preach with our lives. God is still in control. God is still the reason for the peace inside us, the hope in our future, and the creator of all existence. So here's a reminder for all of us this morning. We serve a God who provides hope, even in times that seem hopeless. So here are three reasons that we, we have hope, and here are three questions that we need to answer after looking at those reasons. First, I'd like to draw your attention to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we, we've talked about John uh, recently. I made a, a, a video about this, actually, uh, talking about the, the difference between uh, John and the other synoptic gospels that you have, and it's the way that John approaches the subject of God and the way that John talks about God. In verses 1 and 2, he talks about the pre-existence of the Word, that word logos there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. And every statement that John makes builds upon the next. He's talking to a Jewish and Gentile audience, and he's telling them a thing or two about God, the God of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, that Word being Jesus, and Jesus was with God. And then he follows that up with, and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. So here's the hope. The hope is God has always been, and God always will be. And here's our question. Do we serve a God who has ceased to exist in our own minds? If God is alive, then there is no need to panic. If God is alive, then we don't have to spend hours trying to answer meaningless questions. Questions like, was this pandemic planned? Will our nation fall? Will there be a cure? Is the government overextending its power? Will the economy collapse? If God somehow ceased to be, then we should panic. But notice John goes on. In the beginning, this refers to that timeless eternity of Genesis 1 and verse 19 and following. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So John essentially wrote, when the beginning began, the word was already there. The idea that the word existed before creation and even time itself. The word was before you was or anybody was. John makes it clear that the word is not just the beginning, but it is the beginning of the beginning. He was there in the beginning before anything was. So what could possibly threaten our peace when we serve a God like that? God doesn't change. And I realize that sometimes based on things that are happening in the world today and in our nation, it can be harder to see God. It can be harder to see his power and to feel his presence and to hear his voice. But God is still alive and God is still powerful. Notice that phrase, though, was the word that John uses. Did the word have a beginning? John says no. For if we reach back to any beginning, there already was in existence the word. Someone once said, at once it is evident to John's vision, the word is no other than God, the self-existent. Can you do that? Can anybody do that? No one can self-exist. I'm here because God decided that I should be. How humbling to know that you exist because there's a God above that thought you should exist. 
While there are many thoughts and lessons to be had from that truth, here's one in which every other application can be based. We serve a God of immense power. And here's the hope. We're here right now because God decided that we should be here right now. And here's the question. Is there anything that God doesn't have control over? Strangely, the answer to that question is yes. God doesn't control you. You and I have choices. We can choose to love God. We can choose to hate God. We can choose to ignore God. We can choose to learn God. You can choose. God could have forced us all to follow him like robots, and there'd be no pandemic. There'd be no wars. There'd be no pollution. There'd be no corrupt political figures, lying preachers, bad cops, greedy companies, dying churches. But there would also be no love, because love is a choice. And love is something that must be given willingly. God can't force you to even believe in his existence, but John's description is given so that we can grasp this continuous history that runs out of an unmeasured past and identify that power, which is God. Here's the hope. God can use uncertain and frightening situations to show us just how faithful and just how powerful God is. What about when we can't see God, though? What about times right now when the whole world seems to have stopped or changed? Our lives have been affected in, in so many ways, but how can we see God better? I think one of the best ways that you can do this is just to simply look back in history on how God has shown himself before and also look at the people that have struggled with maybe some of the same feelings. I believe that in Daniel chapter 3, you see this on a magnified level. You have people that are facing fear on a level that very few people have actually had to face today. As the crowd of people bow in fear before a giant statue made in the likeness of this egotistical king, there are three men that stand in defiance. In Daniel chapter 3, you read that there's a horn and there's a flute and there's a lyre, among other instruments that sound off. And it's an impressive orchestra and it's an impressive 90-foot image. Everything is intimidating. The sound and the sights before them all testing their allegiance. It must have been hard to see God when you have this 90-foot statue in front of you when people are bowing in the shadow of this statue, and it must have been hard to hear the promises of God over this loud orchestra that was playing. You know, many at this time actually believed that gods were only powerful when they were in that nation or when they were in that area of the country, and outside of that country or outside of that nation, their gods had no power. And so I wonder if Thoughts like that maybe crept into the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they are standing in the midst of a crowd that is bowed before this giant statue. I wonder if anybody with their heads bowed down noticed them standing up next to them and maybe in this panic whisper said, bow down, get down. I wonder if their hearts were racing. I wonder if their stomachs turned over. I wonder if their knees knocked. Then it gets worse. In verse 8 of Daniel chapter 3, you have a group of people called the Chaldeans, and they approach the king. And starting in verse 8, it says, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. So they tell on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these righteous men, you have now tattletales coming before the king and ratting out these three godly individuals. It must have felt like the entire world was out to get these three men, these three that dared to be faithful to God. But one of the most powerful men in the known world at this time, King Nebuchadnezzar, the great Nebuchadnezzar is now burning with rage, and that rage of the most powerful man on earth is now directed at just three people, three loyal followers of God. But then you look down in verse 14, it says, the king gives them an out. So you have these three individuals that make the stand, and they choose not to bow down in front of the image, which already took great courage. And now they're in front of the king, and clearly the king is already angry at you, 
But then he says, is it true that when the music plays, you have refused my order to worship my gods and fall before my statue? But if you do, all will be okay. In essence, what the king was saying is, if you bow down before this statue, we'll just pretend that this whole thing never happened. But he follows that up with, if not, I'm going to throw you into this giant fiery furnace. Now, if you're standing before the king, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes here. If I'm standing before the king, I would be patting myself on the back that I at least had gotten that far. That at least I had the courage to stand up. And whether they were arrested or brought before the king, however they got there, they are now standing before him and they have a decision to make. Will we continue down the path that has already gotten us in this much trouble or will we just live another day? So they're standing before the king and they have a decision to make. Defy him or bow down to the gods that he had set in place. The text says that the king's face physically altered. He was so angry that his face physically changed. And it says that his mighty warriors, they then bind them up, they blindfold them. And even though they can't see or they're, they're bound up at this point, the, the room is getting hotter and hotter because the furnace is then made seven times hotter than it already was. And it's so hot, in fact, that it kills these strong warriors that are tasked with this very gruesome execution. But we all know what happens and how they make it out of this situation. There's a fourth person in the furnace. There's a fourth man in the fire. That fourth man in the furnace is the same God that we serve here at Farley. That's the same Jesus that died for us. It's the same God that shows himself in such miraculous ways to these men in a time where it seemed like they were the only ones who were faithful and willing to follow. The king declares, there is no other God who can rescue in this way. The king has done a complete 180 from how uh, angry and how vengeful he was towards these individuals. Now he's saying, there is no other God who can rescue in this way. And it seems like he has misapplied uh, or doesn't really understand who this God is because in Nebuchadnezzar fashion, he says, anyone who doesn't worship this God of the Israelites is going to be torn limb from limb. So, I mean, he, has, he still has some things to learn about uh, the God of heaven, but he does change because he sees the power of God. And that's the point that I want to focus on. In a time that seems so unsure, unsure our actions can make the world declare there is no other God who can save us now. Other events in the Old Testament are like Jonah, who's thrown into the sea, and his Savior is a giant fish. And it still seems uncertain, even though God is totally in control. But Jonah's life becomes a testimony of God's power. What about our lives today? The world seems to be panicking over this pandemic, and the future seems uncertain. But God can show himself through us. It doesn't matter how hot the furnace is, how big the waves are around us, how many have lost their jobs, how great or terrible the economy becomes. God is alive. God is powerful. God is still in control. And if he doesn't show himself in our lives, then he will show himself in the life of somebody else. It takes courage and it takes faithfulness, as we've seen in these three men here in Daniel chapter 3 and in other uh, men that you could look at both in the Old and New Testament, but let us allow the God who has always been, the God who will always be, the God who decided that we should exist be seen through us. We can provide hope to a world that is living in a hopeless time because we serve a God who gives us hope in a hopeless time. While there is no physical invitation where you can come down and sit on uh, the front pew as usual, the invitation of Jesus always stands. And if there is something that you need, if there are the prayers of the church that you need, then please feel free to contact either the Farley Church of Christ through their website or to contact uh, me or one of the elders here, either through uh, email or phone. If you would like to put on Christ in baptism, pandemic or not, and uh, social distancing or not, we can make that happen. 
If there's anything that you would need, if you'd like to respond to the invitation of our Lord, then you can this morning, and you can turn your life around to be a more faithful Christian or to start that walk as a Christian this morning. Thank you, Dale, for that lesson. Our song will be number 335, Sing and Be Happy. Sing the first and third verse. Let us sing. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we've had to worship you, and even though it's in a different way than we're used to, we're so grateful that uh, the church is not a building and that the church is uh, the people and that we can uh, pray to you from anywhere about anything. We're so grateful for uh, that sacrifice that we have that made all of this possible in the first place, that sacrifice of Jesus that gives us that hope and uh, heaven and uh, Lord, right, we look forward to uh, your return when we can be called home uh, to heaven, and we're so grateful for uh, that assurance that we do have because of Him. Lord, help us now to uh, be lights in our individual communities and wherever we find ourselves to shine the light of of Jesus and to show the world uh, that that Christianity offers something different, and help us to uh, show the the peace that we have because of. Uh, of your son and because of that uh, joy that we have and uh, the lives that we can live differently. Father, we're so thankful for uh, the churches that are still trying to look for different ways to uh, reach out to the community to make uh, worship services happen for uh, the members and we can ask your continued prayers um, to be with all of us who are still trying to um, maybe look for jobs or uh, figure out how to uh, function in a world that's changed so much. Lord, even though all the things uh, have changed drastically, we're still grateful that we can see uh, your presence and we can see your power in the world today. Help us to live more and more like your son each and every day of our lives and help us to realize uh, how holy and how mighty you are and that the world is truly in your hands and that we have nothing to fear. Lord, we love you so much and it's in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 